My name is Roshan Butler and I have the great honour of being the presiding officer at the National Assembly for Wales. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to what I'm sure promises to be a fascinating lecture. Today, being the first Remembrance Day that falls within the four-year commemoration for the First World War, it is particularly poignant that we host this event in which our guest speaker will explore the role that Wales and the Welsh people played in the Great War. Now, the First World War had a great impact on us all, and the countless stories of incredible courage, toil and sacrifice that was made by our grandparents, great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents have laid the foundations of a fair and democratic society in which we live and, in, and enjoy today. Now, here at the National Assembly for Wales, we are committed to commemorating the First World War for a number of reasons. Firstly, the sheer scale of the sacrifice. It was absolutely immense. When our servicemen and women initially set out, they had no idea how long the war would last, and many thought they would be back by Christmas. Only after months of heavy artillery battles and countless deaths did the real horror of war set in. Now, with estimates between 9 and 15 million, the number of casualties has resulted from the Great War dwarfs that of any conflict since. The statistics are really quite astounding. The then Indian Empire lost more than 70,000 people. Canada, where I was a fortnight ago, lost more than 60,000, as did Australia. 40,000 Welshmen lost their lives, and this was a sacrifice they made for us, and it is right that we, as a democratically elected body in Wales, commemorate them appropriately. We can also trace the origins of a number of very significant advances in our society back to this period of our history. One such advance that is particularly close to my heart is the incredible bravery demonstrated by the British nurse Edith Cavell, whose actions gained huge acclaim and played an important role in advancing the emancipation of women. Another being the death of the first black British army officer, Walter Tell, in March 1918. Now this was seen as, a, as marking the beginning of the minority ethnic community getting the long overdue respect and equality they so greatly deserve. Now these are just two small examples, and I'm sure I could have chosen hundreds, that, we de uh, that demonstrates why it's so important that we, the people of Wales remember and commemorate those who died and protected our freedom. However, one good consequence of the war was the establishment of the Department of International Politics at the University of Aberystwyth. Founded in 1919 with the help of generous endowment given by David Davis, it served as a memorial to the students killed and wounded in the 1914-18 war. And Dr Jenny Mathers is now head of that internationally re re renowned department. She received her undergraduate degree from Mount Holyoke College in the United States and her MPhil and DPhil from Oxford University. She joined the Department of International Politics in Aberystwyth in 1992 while completing her DPhil thesis on Soviet ballistic missile defence policy from Stalin to Gorbachev. And that's an after dinner. I'm not sure what, but it certainly stops the conversation. Um, her teaching research spans two broad areas, Russian politics and security and gender and war. She edits Minerva Journal of Women and War and convenes the university-wide gender studies research group. Her lecture will look at David Davis's vision uh, that by focusing the attention of scholars on the big issues facing humanity, a more peaceful and just world, uh, world order could be achieved. I've spent the last hour with Jenny and absolutely fascinating. So I'm delighted to introduce you, Jenny Mathers. I hope you have a fascinating lecture to Jochen Bauer. Jenny. Right, good evening. I want to start with some thanks. Um, I want to thank the Welsh Assembly for the invitation to speak about David Davis and the department tonight. I'd like to thank the presiding officer for her very kind introduction and for her company earlier this, this evening, which was very enjoyable. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for attending, coming out on a, uh, a wet, windy evening, uh, which isn't very pleasant, and also a group of small but enthusiastic, a uh, small but enthusiastic group of international politics students from Aberystwyth, um, who just snuck in the back. Um, they came down on a minibus today, and they'll go back tonight. So thank you very much for coming. Preparing this lecture has given me a reason to take a closer look at some of the key moments in the history of the department 
um, both to better understand the personalities and the events of the department in the years before I joined it, um, and also to look with fresh eyes at some of the personalities and the events of the last 22 years since I was appointed. It's also reminded me of the importance of making the current staff and students aware of the department's history as we look towards our centenary in, in 2019. I'm so used to saying 1919. I must say 2019. Right, let's see if this works. Yes, good. The title of this talk, Tell the World About the World, is one of the instructions that David Davis gave to the Department of International Politics at Aberystwyth that he founded. What I want to do this evening is start with David Davis and his vision of how peace might, indeed, should be achieved, and talk about how what started with a very particular way of seeing the world and its future has developed into a very diverse and dynamic academic discipline known as international relations, which is taught and studied around the world. I want to talk about how and why the department was founded and provide a broad overview of its development, focusing on certain key moments and also how personalities involved and the work that was done on the west coast of Wales has helped to shape the way that people around the world think about the world and how they behave in it. Let me start by quoting from a letter written by then Major David Davis MP, Vice President of the University College of Wales Aberystwyth, to its president in November 1918. The armistice has been signed and the statesmen of nations will soon assemble to undertake the task of concluding the Pact of Peace, which we all ardently hope will herald in a new world freed from the menace of war. Out of their deliberations, our supreme desire is to see established a League of Free Peoples for maintenance of international right and the enforcement of international duty. Beyond all material reparations and all territorial adjustments, this foundation of a righteous peace among civilized states may prove to be the most permanent and valuable result of the war. The plenipotentiaries at the peace conference can lay the foundations of a league of free peoples, but they cannot rear the temple of peace. That is the task of the coming generation, and for its achievement, we shall need consecrated energy, goodwill, knowledge, and enlightened public opinion in all countries. Old problems must be confronted in a new spirit. Insular and vested prejudices must, must be removed. Understanding and toleration need to be greatly developed. It is an immense task, and a myriad agencies will be required to discharge it. Among these must be our universities and our own University of Wales, whose sons have so freely laid down their lives in the morning of their days, and whose memory our little nation will wish to cherish for all time. It has occurred to my sisters and myself that the University of Wales and the Council of the College may be willing to allow us to found a chair of international politics at Aberystwyth in memory of the fallen students of our university, for the study of those related problems of law and politics, of ethics and economics, which are raised by the project of a League of Nations, and for the encouragement of a truer understanding of civilization other than our own. We are prepared to contribute for this object the sum of 20,000 pounds, and we should be glad if our proposal is accepted, that the chair should be associated with the illustrious name of President Wilson. I think I've gone past. Nope, I haven't. Sorry, there we go. Okay. This letter encapsulates several important elements of a story that I want to tell, and it demonstrates that they were present right from the beginning. First, the desire for furthering the cause of peace, growing out of direct and personal experience of the horrors of war, specifically the First World War, and in the memory of those who died in this war. So we have the importance of the individual and his experience. Notice I say his experience. I'm going to return to that. Gendered assumptions inherent in the subject later on. This gives us part of the answer to the question, who is this effort for? In the letter, we also have a particular vision of how to further the cause of peace. David Davis was a great supporter of a League of Nations, believing that the creation of international institutions and the nations of the world acting together would enable an end to war. In fact, although Davis came out of a liberal, non-conformist tradition, he believed in the judicious threat and use of force in order to achieve peace. He was a prolific author and expounded on his opinions at some length, including in a book entitled Force, which set out his ideas for how that might be done, in particular through the creation of an international police force with a worldwide monopoly on the possession of tanks, airplanes, submarines, and poison gas. Of course, these views about the means for achieving peace were not shared 
by all or maybe any of the academics who went on to work in the department, either in the short term or the long term. But the very specificity of Davis's vision does introduce the vital question of means to the end. In other words, who should act in international politics and what tools should they use? Right. Now we get to Woodrow Wilson. Davis's idea was that the international institutions needed to be led by the great men of the time, such as Woodrow Wilson, but that their efforts, in other words, the efforts of the great men, were not enough, and that educated citizens had an important role to play. Hence, the explicit intertwining from the outset of scholarship in the form of establishing a chair in the university, together with what we might refer to today as engagement, both with the policy world and with the public, and also teaching. Finally, Davis invented, uh, sorry, identified several fields of study that he regarded as vital for understanding and furthering the cause of peace. Law, politics, ethics, and economics. So from the beginning was the notion of a bringing together of different disciplines to enable a fuller understanding of war and how to bring about peace. In a nutshell then, Davis sums up some of the key components of the debates that have shaped and continue to shape the discipline of IR. What is it? Whose perspectives are important? Who has the power and the authority to act? What actions should they take? What tools should they use? How should scholars relate to the real world of policy and the public? And what role does teaching play in all of this? So actually encapsulated in quite a short letter, dated 1918, you have summed up a lot of the things which have preoccupied the scholars of international relations um, ever since that time. It's worth pointing out that although David Davis had quite a clear idea of what he wanted to achieve in establishing a chair named for Woodrow Wilson in this unknown field of study he named international politics, it was by no means certain when he first conceived the idea that the chair would be based in Aberystwyth. Several ma major cities were under serious consideration at the time. There was Geneva, there was Strasbourg, and there was Oxford. But apparently his sisters, Margaret and Gwendolyn, persuaded him to make the beneficiary the local university college in Aberystwyth, perhaps as part of the wider theme of philanthropy to benefit Wales that characterized this generation of the Davis family. It has certainly struck me over the years, just living in Wales and traveling around it, how often I read one or another of the names David, Margaret, or Gwendolyn Davis on the plaques of buildings that I see as donors who enable the particular institutions to be established and maintained, and as people who allow particular buildings to be built. As we have recently celebrated Philanthropy Week here in Wales, I'm reminded of the many ways that the Davis family's philanthropic gifts have had a lasting legacy here. If we turn to the trustees setting up the Wilson Chair Endowment Fund in 1922, we learn a bit more about how Davis envisioned the holder of the Wilson Chair performing his duties. The Wilson Chair Endowment Fund was set up to provide money for, and I quote, the payment of a traveling allowance to the professor to enable him to reside or travel from time to time in foreign countries, in order to enable him to gain an insight into the political systems and aims and social conditions of other countries, and in particular, to learn the views of their statesmen and public men, it being the wish of the founders, that is, the Davises, that the knowledge of the professor shall be practical and not purely academical. The early holders of the Wilson Chair were necessarily drawn from a range of disciplines and interpreted their mandate in a number of ways. The first person to occupy it was Alfred Zimmern, who was appointed in April 1919. He was an expert in ancient history who was lured to Aberystwyth from Oxford University. His background in ancient history didn't stop him from giving lectures on international relations, the machinery of government, and the League of Nations Covenant. In the 1919-20 academic year, he offered courses in international economic relations, elements of politics, as well as Greek philosophy. Zimmern also introduced a weekly class where he provided a commentary on topical events. And nearly 100 students would show up every single week for this topical class. Now, since there were only a handful of students who were actually studying international politics at that time, this means, of course, he must have drawn his audience from across the whole university college from a wide variety of subjects, which means they can only have attended because they were really interested in hearing what he had to say. It couldn't possibly have helped them pass their examinations. 
Now, we still do something quite akin to Zimmern's regular classes on topical events, although we don't do it every single week in the department. Um, we do start every new teaching semester with a round table um, of academic staff commenting on some topical issue. Um, last year in September, we did this on Syria. Um, this year in September, we looked at issues of sovereignty and statehood, um, considering challenges to it, such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Islamic State. These events aren't just for our students, they're open to the public, and we always get a really good number of people coming from the community. Not only did the students at Aberystwyth enjoy Zimmern's lectures, he enjoyed their attention. He later remarked, Wales presented an almost ideal field for the teacher. Welsh students have a delightful facility of apprehension, while the friendly receptiveness of a Welsh audience is almost uncanny to one who has painfully won his spurs in England. Setting ideas before Welshmen is like lighting a fire of straw, while talking to Englishmen is more like trying to kindle wet wood. <laughs> During the first decade or so after the Wilson Chair was established, the published works of its occupants were firmly focused on how to solve the problem of world peace and lay the foundations for a better international order. The teaching program similarly required students to examine international institutions and law, especially the structure and workings of a League of Nations, although not always from a respectful and approving point of view. Before moving on to talk about the next stage in the department's development and in the development of a discipline of IR, I just want to pause and consider this photograph, which is in front of you, um, about the first, which, which depicts the first session of the League of Nations, the institution that Davis put so much faith in and that was the subject of so much debate and study. When the practice of international politics is thought of, certainly in the interwar years, but to a certain extent still today, this image is the kind of image that many have in their minds. It's a group of statesmen making the important decisions that affect the rest of us. In other words, this is what is important, and this is what we should pay attention to. In spite of the original motivating factor behind David Davis's gift in 1919 of remembering the students of Aberystwyth who had died in the war and seeking a path away from war and towards the peaceful revolution of resolution of international politics, the emphasis on states and high diplomacy tended to remove ordinary people from the equation. Not only that, but as feminist scholars of IR would argue much, much later, the fact that most of the people who act on behalf of states and in the arena of international diplomacy were, and still are, mostly men, has also shaped the way that international relations works in the policy world and the way that we study it. In other words, IR, as it is practiced and studied, is gendered, and mostly gendered male. Now, I was really pleased to find this particular image of the League of Nations when I was putting together these slides because not only does it show us the League at its, very first nation, at its very first meeting, but there's a lovely contrast here between the men in the foreground, who are meant to be the focus of our attention, and the woman off to the side, who is just watching, apparently unnoticed by the important men. Now, I don't know who she is, and I don't know why she was there, but the composition illustrates my point very nicely about how certain kinds of people get included or excluded from our attention when we define what does and doesn't matter in IR and I'll come back to this a little bit later. However, I want to turn now to the time of the most well-known occupant of the Wilson chair so far, and that is Edward Hallett Carr. Carr had a very successful career in the Foreign Office, which he left in order to take up the chair in Aberystwyth. As one of my former colleagues in the department, Mick Cox, wrote in an extended introduction to a new edition of Carr's most famous book, The 20 Years' Crisis, Carr's decision to leave London for Aberystwyth was, quote, one of the oddest decisions he ever took in an extraordinarily long and very distinguished career. Aberystwyth, after all, was hardly one of the more fashionable universities in the United Kingdom, and West Wales was about as far away as it was possible to get from the centres of political and intellectual power where Carr had hitherto spent nearly all of his life. What appealed to Carr about the post, apparently, is that it would give him the time and the freedom to publish his ideas about international politics and also about the development of politics and economics in the Soviet Union, something he simply could not do as a senior civil servant based in Whitehall. In fact, however, Carr barely left London at all, commuting every week to Aberystwyth to spend two days fulfilling the very limited teaching commitments of the post. By the time that Carr was appointed in 1936, the Wilson chair had lain vacant for two years, 
And while the first three men to occupy it had dutifully made international institutions and the League of Nations in particular a focus of their work and their teaching, none of them were sufficiently enthusiastic about the League and the range of measures that David Davis believed should go with it to satisfy Davis. By this time, he was Lord David Davis of Clendingham. In fact, in July 1934, Davis told the principal of Aberystwyth, Evoy Evans, that he, Davis, quote, had been greatly disappointed to find that Professor Jerome Green, that is the third Wilson professor, had expressed opinions on the proposed international police force, which were dramatically opposed to those he himself advocated, and felt that, as founder of the chair, his views were entitled to some consideration when the new appointment was made. Evor Evans admitted, this remark caused me very considerable anxiety. Of the candidates who were on the short list, David, Davis feigned, favored a painter named W. Arnold Foster, who had no academic qualifications in any field that seemed obviously related to international politics, but who was a great enthusiast for the League of Nations. When his favorite was not chosen, Davis was so incensed that he apparently stormed out of the meeting. History tells us this curious detail that he left his fishing rods behind him. Why he brought fishing rods to a meeting of the Wilson board in London is not explained. Later, Davis resigned his position as president of the college. Carr, who was appointed in the end, was a very prolific writer. He produced seven books during his 11 years as the Wilson chair, many of them composed on the train as he traveled back and forth to London each week. I think of Carr every time I take that same train journey between Aberystwyth and London, which, 80 years later, still takes five hours <laughs> each way. Of all the pieces Carr wrote, the one that has undoubtedly had the greatest impact on the development of the discipline of international relations and also on the way that international relations is understood by the layperson and spoken of by the policymaker was The Twenty Years' Crisis, which was published in 1939 and has never been out of print. The outlines of the argument that Carr made in that book were clearly in his mind for several years before it appeared. As they formed the basis of his inaugural lecture on the 14th of October, 1936. Carl Carr critiqued the major schools of thought that then dominated scholarly and policymakers' discussions of how best to ensure peace in the world, including the collectivists who favored international institutions such as the League, an international police force of the kind promoted by David Davis, and so on. Instead, Carr argued for what he called realism, by which he meant taking things as they were rather than as one would wish them to be. Now, realism as a way of understanding how the world works has since developed into a complex grouping of academic debates and discussions. In its crudest terms, comes in for a lot of criticism on the grounds that it ignores or downplays many important factors that do shape how the world works. Carr's particular understanding of realism, however, included consideration of domestic politics and economics, as well as transnational factors, all of which realism is often criticized for overlooking. This may be because Carr was particularly fascinated with the Soviet Union, which, in the 1930s, was developing along very different lines from the major Western powers. It was the Soviet example that made Carr ask whether we should widen our conception of power beyond military might. Now, from our perspective standing here in 2014, we might find this view of the Soviet Union very puzzling. After all, in what sense was the USSR a powerful actor in the world and taken seriously, if not for its military might? But it's important to remember that Carr, of course, was writing in the 1930s. This was well before the USSR became a military superpower. Carr was disillusioned with liberalism, particularly because of the collapse of the international financial system in 1929 and the depression of the 1930s. While the Soviet experiment with a centralized planning economy, planned economy seemed to be getting some very impressive results. Through his published works and his teaching while occupying the Wilson chair, E.H. Carr gave somewhat different answers to several of the questions that I posed earlier, or that Davis posed, about the discipline of IR. For example, Carr argued for a shift from a preoccupation with international institutions to a greater willingness to look at the world as it really is. And this included paying attention to what happens within states, how they organize their economies, 
and the extent to which they are able to provide their citizens with prosperity and a hopeful future. This begins to take us a few steps away from the men in suits, debating big ideas far removed from the lives of ordinary people. Before leaving Carr's period as Wilson chair, I want to quote from another letter by David Davis. He wrote a lot of letters. Written in 1943, during the Second World War, which again laments the failure of successive professors to champion his program for the promotion of peace. And here we can see the sense of responsibility that he felt he had laid upon the shoulders of the Wilson chair and the interconnection between scholarship of international politics and what happens in the real world. Almost since the inception of this department, it has worked consistently against the program I have spent most of my time and money in advocating, namely, the development of the League into a real international authority. All the professors from Zimmern onwards opposed these ideas, with the result that we have been landed in another bloody war, which is going to ruin most of us and will inflict untold misery and impoverishment upon every country in the world. So there we have it. The International Politics Department at Aberystwyth was responsible for the Second World War. From 1946, when Carr resigned as the Wilson chair, until the early 1990s, that is, essentially throughout the period of the Cold War, the scholarship and teaching in the department reflected and shaped the predominant concerns of the time. Attention shifted from cooperation and the state of the world, and the states, rather, of the world working together for peace through all-encompassing international institutions, towards looking at power, national interest, and security especially national and international security, to be achieved through the acquisition, threat, and use of military force. A new subfield developed in the discipline known as strategic studies, and Aberystwyth established the first lectureship in strategic studies anywhere in the world, we believe, appointing John Garnett to it. John, of course, later joined the ranks of the Wilson professors. A lot of work was done on nuclear weapons and seeking to understand the role that they were playing in international relations. Members of staff produced major books um, on issues such as nuclear strategy, the establishment and work in NATO, and deterrence and deterrence theory. And the major names from this period uh, that you may recognize are John Bayliss, Ken Booth, Michael McGuire, and of course the two Wilson chairs of the time, Lawrence Martin and John Garnett. The department developed very close links with the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Defense during these years. The Cold War marked a shift in emphasis towards the military instrument, strategy, and security. And in many respects, it kept the emphasis on great men thinking great thoughts and controlling the destinies of nations. The introduction of nuclear weapons and large-scale superpower rivalries cast a very large and dense shadow. Although it's worth noting, that Ken Booth's growing dissatisfaction with mainstream approaches and looking in the usual places for the usual suspects began during this time. One of the landmarks of this period in the department's history was the conference that was held to mark its 50th anniversary and the resulting book titled The Aberystwyth Papers. The conference was held in December 1969 at Grigonog Hall, which had previously been the home of the Davis sisters and which they later gave to the University of Wales, and which is still used as a conference center now, and which our students will be going to in, in a week or two um, to do their crisis games. It was the occasion for some serious historical reflection on the history of the ideas produced and developed by the staff in the department over the years, and it was attended by some of the most famous academics of the time and leading figures in the development of IR as a discipline. E.H. Carr was there, so was Charles Manning and, ha and Hans Mo Morgenthau. It was also very much an establishment event. Senior members of the university were there, along with staff and students from the department. The Chancellor of the University of Wales, the Duke of Edinburgh, expressed his interest in the meeting, and he sent his best wishes for its success. And indeed, he wrote a foreword to the book. According to the photographs that I've seen of the event, one of which is reproduced on a display panel in the West Room in the department, only one woman attended, the departmental secretary. During the 1990s, both the international community and the discipline of international relations spent some time in search of new ways of understanding the post-Cold War world. And the department similarly developed into a place where a range of views and perspectives and areas of expertise expanded very considerably. 
one of the key personalities of this period was a man named Steve Smith, now Sir Steve, Vice Chancellor of Exeter University. Steve was appointed to a very large extent to build up the department's graduate school, which he did very successfully. But Steve also acted as a catalyst, which is a role that comes naturally to him as a person with boundless energy and drive. And he helped to spark what became a very vibrant, exciting academic community, which became more intellectually diverse in its approaches to the discipline. In terms of the work that was produced during that period in the department, there were some new developments and some clear themes. For example, the serious study of the post-Cold War practice of humanitarian intervention in the name of promoting peace and ending conflict. This was the time of Bosnia, Rwanda, Kosovo, and the idea that, with the Cold War just a memory, the great powers of the world could work together in the interest of peace. So quite reminiscent of David Davis's vision of a liberal internationalist order. Sitting side by side with that was the development of a distinctive Aberystwyth School of Critical Security Studies, which has helped to give the word security a broader meaning than simply the traditional one, which was pretty much interchangeable with strategy and the use of force. Now, just last week, or was it two weeks ago, I was um, visiting um, a European campus of an American university, which I will not name, and having some discussions with them about some possible links that we might have. And I was trying to explain to my American colleague um, that security could have a different meaning than simply the management of conflict and the use of force. And after half an hour, I still hadn't quite persuaded him. So I think that gives you an indication that the Aber view of security um, is maybe a little bit different from even um, other academics who, who study and teach IR. I'm gonna give you three further examples of the intellectual diversity of a department's development in the 1990s. First, during the 1990s, it helped to pioneer the academic study of the intelligence services and the role that intelligence plays in international security, including appointing the first lectureship, we believe, in the world in intelligence studies. This work was and continues to be done by international historians in the department <clears throat> who comb the archives for details and provide comprehensive and exhaustive studies of the behind the scenes calculations of major events of the Cold War, especially informing our understanding of nuclear history. The second example is the appointment of a lectureship in gender and international relations. The person who held it, Marisha Zalewski. Another first, we think, at least in the UK, although perhaps it is another global first as well. Marisha's appointment helped to raise the consciousness, both of the staff and of the students, about the many ways that IR as a discipline is a very gendered um, discipline and that it's very much gendered male, although she had many uphill battles in the process. Some members of staff were frankly puzzled about what she did all day, and they used to ask her for the feminist perspective on, insert topical news item of the day, in fact, she even wrote an article as a result of this experience, which was called, Well, What is the Feminist Perspective on Bosnia?, which was published in International Affairs in 1995. Several years later, when she edited a book called The Man Question in International Politics, or sorry, International Relations, she included the following joke, which I think illustrates quite nicely the way that scholars of IR, or many scholars of IR, fail to see the point of a gendered approach to their subject. A man and a woman are talking over dinner in a restaurant. The man tells the woman about his life and finally says, okay, that's enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? My third example of the development of the department in the 1990s is a direct result of this, the debate and eventual vote in favor of devolution in Wales in 1997 which sparked a new research agenda in the department and a new research institute, the Institute of Welsh Politics, which brought academic rigor and serious scholarship to bear on the new phenomenon of devolved politics and government in a particular part of the UK. Before I leave the 1990s, I would just like to mention the 75th anniversary conference that took place in 1994. This happened not very long after I was appointed. This was a very different event from the one in 1969. It was a celebration of the state of a discipline, much more so than a celebration of the history of a department. 
And among the speakers was Cynthia Enloe, who is perhaps the best known scholar in the field of feminist approaches to IR. To those of you in the audience who haven't had the pleasure of hearing Cynthia speak, um, if you ever get the chance, please take it, because she's absolutely electrifying. One memory of that conference that's particularly vivid in my mind is from Ken Boo's presentation, which did look backwards at the history of a department, but it also looked forward to a particular moment in its future, its 100th anniversary conference in 2019, in fact. Ken expressed the hope that the then head of department, whoever she was, would issue Ken with an invitation to speak at it. Now, I was in the audience, and I recall that little ripple of amusement that spread around the audience when he spoke those words. A woman as the head of this department, Ken really was indulging in a flight of fancy there. Who could imagine such a thing? I had absolutely no premonition all those years ago that one day I would find myself as that mythical creature, the female head of this department. And can I say I am the first woman ever to head this department in nearly 100 years. We like to think that our location in a small town on the west coast of Wales, at least two hours from the nearest straight road or Marks and Spencers, gives us academics a certain intellectual as well as physical distance from the immediate concerns and demands of the policy world and policymakers. I won't go so far as to say that this distance gives Aber Interpol a better understanding of the real world, but our take on current events is usually rather different from the mainstream perhaps informed by a longer term and more critical perspective. This was brought home to me very vividly during some encounters and conversations I had with civil servants in London over the summer, and even more so when I attended um, the Wales-NATO summit in Newport in September. A good example of the Aber Interpol take on what happens in the world of policy and diplomacy came in the aftermath of the events of, 11, of the 11th of September 2001. Everyone who is old enough to recall that day tends to remember where they were when they heard the news about planes hitting the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York. It's etched into the memory in the same way that the assassination of Kennedy was for a previous generation. My own most vivid memory of 9-11 is not so much the day itself, although aspects of that day are still very fresh in my mind, but an event that the department held a few weeks later. It was clear from the outset that 9-11 wasn't important perhaps a defining moment in the practice of international politics out there in the world, and in the impact that it would have and continue to have, perhaps for a long time to come, on the lives of many people. We in the department decided to organize a round table discussion in the first week of the academic year, as soon as the students and all the staff were back in Aber, to discuss the event and some of the issues that it raised from the perspective of a range of staff areas of expertise. The round table was held on an evening in Freshers' Week in the old college down on the seafront. Those of you who know Aberystwyth will know what I'm talking about. At that time, the Interpol department didn't enjoy the luxury, which we have now, of being located in a building with a large enough room, which was capable of seating a significant number of people. So we tended to use rooms in the old college, public lectures, and other events that we thought might draw large audiences. I don't recall the maximum seating capacity of the lecture theater that we used that night, but it was something on the order of 200, and it was completely full, with people sitting on the floor and propping themselves against the walls. Although the members of staff who spoke that evening were not unanimous in their views by any means, there were some common themes to their remarks, which centered around skepticism about finding simple explanations and easy responses to this latest example of international political violence particularly the automatic responses of a number of Western capitals, namely to use the language of war to explain the events and what would follow, to reach for the use of military force to provide a response, and to decide that targeting particular foreign nation states was the appropriate way to reach, punish, and deter like-minded perpetrators. If 9-11 marked a break with the way that international relations was conducted, as George W. Bush and others claimed, why then use the same old tools in response? Fellow academics who are here in the audience in the field of politics and international relations will know that the International Studies Association, or ISA, is the major US-based professional association that brings together scholars from around the world who study this subject. 
Among the participants at ISA in 2003 was Steve Smith, who technically was no longer representing the department at that point because he'd just left the year before, take up his post as vice chancellor at Exeter. But I'm going to claim that his outlook is still, was still shaped at that time um, by his period in Aber, and so was representing the department <clears throat> intellectually. Steve was then beginning his term of office as president of the association. He was the first person ISA had ever chosen to be its president, who was based in an institution outside the United States. This says something about ISA, but I won't go into that here. Steve used the discussion of his address, the occasion of his address, rather, to the assembled scholars to talk about the ongoing ramifications of 9-11. At the time of the conference, the United States and several of its allies, known as the Coalition of the Willing, were making their final preparations to launch an invasion of Iraq on the grounds that the Iraqi government had some responsibility for the attacks of 9-11 and that they had concealed a supply of weapons of mass destruction and therefore posed a threat to international security. Steve's lecture, which was later published in the ISA journal International Studies Quarterly as an article entitled Singing Our World Into Existence, International Relations Theory and September 11th, argued that scholars of international relations were and are complicit in the events of 9-11 and in the policy responses that followed it by contributing to particular ways of understanding the world. Steve was arguing, and this is a very rough paraphrasing of his argument, that by privileging certain ways of being made insecure, such as acts of political violence rather than poverty and global inequality, and by implying through our focus of scholarship that certain peoples, such as those in prosperous Western countries, are more deserving of a secure life and future than others, and by our emphasis on war and the tools of war, namely military force, that we as academics have helped to make the world that we inhabit and study. The world is as it is because we make it that way. It was a very powerful indictment of a discipline and a very brave thing for Steve to have done at that time and in front of that audience. In other words, Steve was providing some difficult answers to the same questions, difficult and different answers to the same questions that David Davis posed in his letter of November 1918 that I quoted from at the beginning of my talk. What is this discipline of IR? Whose perspectives are important? Who has the right to act in this sphere? Using what tools? How does our research and our teaching relate to the real world of international politics as it is practiced? Now, I'm going to conclude. Much of the work going on in the department today reflects key aspects of Davis's vision about scholars actively engaging in the world of international politics as it is practiced, seeking to make the world better and using their position as scholars to do that. I want to conclude tonight by mentioning the work done by one of my colleagues named Hugh Bennett. Hugh did his undergraduate work and his PhD studies in the department. And he has recently returned to the department after a short stint at another university, which I won't name. Hugh is an international historian, and he's someone who loves to immerse himself in dusty archives. So not an example, one might think, of a scholar whose work might contribute to making the world a better place and engaging in debates about how the world should work. But among the dusty documents that Hugh has unearthed in the archives in the, in the course of some of his research were papers that were used in the successful court case last year that finally got justice for Kenyans who were subjected to wrongful imprisonment, interrogation, and torture during the Mau Mau uprising. Hugh was among a number of historians whose work was presented as evidence by the lawyers arguing on behalf of the Kenyans. I will leave you with this example, which I think is an excellent one, of a scholar acting in the best tradition of David Davis's exhortation to tell the world about the world. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to listen to them, although I don't pr promise that I can answer them fully, but we'll see. Yes. Fascinating lecture, and I've uh, always enjoyed my visits to Aberystwyth, and uh, 
uh, the, the contribution of the Davis family t to, to Wales is, is enormous. I used to work at the Temple of Peace and Health. Uh, it was interesting to hear that phrase in one of the letters, the Temple of Peace was, of course, mm -hmm. the, the 1920s equivalent to a new world order. Um, but David Davis, to me, means collective security. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm sure he'd be disappointed uh, in you know, all sorts of uh, discussions that we now hear, not particularly the academic ones, but though that would apply there, I think, but also generally you know, in, in, in political discourse, that we don't talk about collective security. And of course, that to me gives a better handle on talking about economic and social issues in terms of security as well. But, you know, there is an issue that war is deeply in, certainly, male uh, uh, DNA. And we're seeing that now, aren't we, in absolute spades in, in the Middle East, where young men are influenced by older men, people my age generally, um, you know, to blow themselves and others to kingdom come. And, you know, that really is, you know, that violent thought is, is as bad as, you know, probably what the David Davis's generation had to deal with. And... Uh, I'm not sure that we've, we've moved on very much. And I just wonder if, in terms of you know, building collective security, that shouldn't be the way to go. And that does bring you on to the importance of institutions, which David Davis certainly would be jumping up and down now, saying, hold on, you know, we can de deconstruct this too savagely if you're not careful. Right. Um, well. One thing that I would want to uh, perhaps disagree with you somewhat about is this question about um, violence and human nature, because it seems to me that that's, that's an easy way out and that you can find many more examples of uh, humans behaving in cooperative ways um, than in violent ways. And the reason why these issues, why these examples of, of political violence make the news is because they are relatively rare. Um, and it's the everyday examples of, of kindness and cooperation that, that don't make the news. So I would, I would not necessarily want to start from that point. Um, but I think you're absolutely right to say that David Davis was an enormous believer in international institutions. Um, but he was very much a believer in a particular kind of international institution. He had uh, very strong views about um, the importance of peace to, to the extent that it, had, it, it should, in fact, be enforced. Um, and that people should almost be compelled to be peaceful, um, which is quite an interesting way of, of thinking about it. Um, so yes, he would be um, unhappy. I mean, he, he would have enjoyed the, the height of the, the emphasis on humanitarian intervention in the 90s um, and, and a lot of the, the sort of the rhetoric around that. He would have been quite interested, I would imagine, in the whole um, area of democracy promotion um, as a way of trying to achieve and spread you know, peaceful relations among nations probably something that he would have been very interested in. But yes, I think he would have, have seen the, the breakdown of the post-Cold War brief areas of cooperation um, with, with great dismay. You want to wait for the mic to come? Uh, just regarding uh, the name of the chair being from Woodrow Wilson and his love for the League of Nations, mm -hmm. did it ever the irony being that Woodrow Wilson failed to get his own country into the League of Nations being seen as one of the biggest failings of the League of Nations. Was that, did that ever, just for uh, Lord Davis's mind, really? Um, I think Davis was very much enamored, I mean, he was very enamored of Wilson's um, goals and his aims and his aspirations. Um, and uh, didn't, well, at, at the point at which the, the chair was established, it wasn't clear whether or not the United States would enter or not, and obviously, you know, Davis hoped that the U.S. would. Um, but nevertheless, I think he, he, he still felt that even without the U.S. in it, um, the League of Nations had, had the p potential to be something which was really special. Um, so, yes, I think, but yes, of course, it's ironic. It's ironic that, you know, it's named for Wilson. It's ironic that, that none of the holders have ever really embraced um, you know, a lot of Wilson's um, ideals, um, you know, there are, there, it's, it's fraught with irony. Um, and, uh, and I chuckle every time we receive a piece of post in the department addressed to Professor Woodrow Wilson, which we still do from time to time. <laughs> Stunned you into silence.
direct question? Of course. I think they want to let you use the microphone. Why did the United States not join the, United, the League of Nations in 1920? Because they were still very much um, wishing to remain separate from the world. Um, you consider that a big factor in what happened afterwards? Well, mm, now here I'm, I have to hold my hand up and say I'm, I'm not a historian of, of this period, so um, I'm maybe not the best qualified person to, to comment on it, but um, I, would, I would say it was maybe only one element of, of a number of, of reasons why the League never really managed to be successful. Alad Edwards from uh, Katyn Churches Together in Wales. Um, just a very, very modern, um, devolved perspective of going to um, Bosnia recently and having a cold, chilling day in Srebrenica and reflecting on one graffiti in the wall there, UN, piercing and painful, united nothing. And we reflected with some academics in Sarajevo that evening on the consequences for us in modern Europe if um, the UK withdrew from the European Convention on Human Rights. And the word that was used was catastrophic. And I did reflect a little that evening on the David Davis legacy of believing that there should be, if you like, a pan-European collectiveness that said if you abuse people in a place like Srebrenica, it affects all of us. And I'm just wondering if you have any reflections on how he would have approached that today. Um, and I'm thinking very much, um, we were smiling earlier on, some of us are devolution geeks in this building. Um, what might happen if uh, Westminster might want to have a legislative, or might be compelled to have a legislative consent motion if it did wish to withdraw from the European um, uh, Act or to repeal it. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on how he would have set his mind to this rather modern Welsh dynamic in a new, very vibrant world that's changing quickly. Well, at the risk of putting words in the mouth of a man I never met and who's been dead for many years, um, I would, would hazard a guess that he would want um, Wales to be very much at the heart of of a of, of worldwide and European-wide movement. As you rightly say, uh, I think, as, as his, his thinking went on, something I didn't manage to include in, in the lecture was that um, his focus increasingly shifted towards a European dimension, and he was very interested in, in you know, the European nations coming together um, to work together. So I think he would have been um, very dismayed at the prospect of, of the UK or London withdrawing from any sort of European uh, cooperative initiative and would have wanted to see Wales um, pick up the banner and, uh, and carry it forward for sure. Hi, thank you. Congratulations first of all on being the first woman in, in your role, that's, that's excellent. Um, and thank you for the speech too. Uh, the, the, I just wanted to, a couple of questions really around, you mentioned that, that you'd been on a visit uh, trying to talk to an American colleague about the meaning of security and then that Steve Smith had given that speech to the ISA. And I wondered how successful you feel you've been in, in getting Aberystwyth to have a broader view of security and, and embedding the sort of wider thinking around poverty and, the broad, and the, those sort of issues as part of the study of international politics. And also, um, I suppose, whether you've been, you feel you've made progress in getting a more balanced gendered view of, of that field, both in Aberystwyth and indeed spreading that word more widely let me see. Um, on the latter point about, about gender, um, I think we're, we're, we're working on it. Um, we now have a lot more, well, more teaching in the department focused on, on gender and, and feminism and more research focused on that area. Um, and I think consciousness is, is being raised to a much greater extent so that um, my, my colleagues who don't work in this area are nevertheless 
um, reasonably familiar with the outlines of, of the arguments and the positions, um, which is a very considerable step forward in comparison with um, when, I, when I joined the department. Um, when I have to hold my hand up, I was one of those who, um, although I was you know, personally a feminist, I had never seen the, the relevance of feminism to my own work. Um, um, now I do, but you know, at that stage, the thought of, of the relevance of feminism to nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union was just you know, totally unimaginable to me. Um, so I think we've, we've developed all, quite a lot um, in, in the direction I would, would wish us to go um, in that respect. Um, our student body, though, is still very male-dominated, so we want to get more women students, for sure. That's something that we need, need to work on. In terms of the, the, a more aberrant perspective or a more critical perspective on security, I mean, I think there, is, there are pockets around the world among um, academics who study this subject. Um, some of whom were trained in the department and have gone out to spread the word. Um, and this is one of our great strengths, um, is the fact that we have and have had for a number of years a very large um, PhD contingent um, of some really excellent high quality students who get their PhDs and then they get jobs as academics around the world and then they, they develop um, ideas which, which they began back in Aber, um, and so that's one way that, that these kinds of ideas do spread. Um, I think the American IR community is a, is a very particular one. Um, they have particular concerns about issues of method, um, particular concerns about um, you know, their relationship with policy and with, with political science as a subject of study. Um, but there's an increasing interest uh, it's a minority interest, but it's an increasing interest um, among scholars, particularly younger scholars and PhD students um, in the US in more critical approaches and approaches which are, are, are less mainstream. And we are getting the benefits of that um, in the attention that we get from prospective students and also in the guest speakers that we get um, constantly coming to, to speak to us and to come to our conferences and so on. Um, so I think within the, the academy, um, we are well known um, for particular kinds of perspectives even if it hasn't completely percolated outwards. Um, um, thanks for that, Jenny. Um, I think it's been about 12 years since I last sat down to one of your lectures, and I'm okay. <laughs> slightly less hungover today than I was then back in uni. Um, I would just be interested in what your perspective, not asking you to again speak for David Davis, but on how would he envisage the international communities and international organizations' role when it comes to Russia and the Ukraine? How would he, what would be his take, would you guess, on, on how things have played out and how they may still? Um, I would guess that he would want to mobilize an international force to uh, take action and to make Russia pay attention to international law and the respect of sovereignty and so on. That, that's, I, that's what I would, would guess, um, definitely, because he was a great believer in international law and in um, respect for certain kinds of, of international rules of the game um, and believed that they should be enforced. And so those who stepped outside those rules should definitely be punished. So I think we would see a very different, if, if David Davis were alive today and in charge, um, I think that um, we would probably have um, adopted military force against Russia by now, for sure. Possibly with catastrophic results, but <laughs> there we are. Um, yes, it's a high risk strategy that, that David um, advocated. Well, thank you very much. It's pleasing, first of all, to be here for such a subject on such a day, and also very pleasing to sort of note that David Davis thought average students were responsible for all the disasters in the world. I think that's possibly one of the nicest things about the Davis Davis Institute, the fact that average students, many here tonight, many here around the world, have been able, and especially Welsh students, have been able to gain such an experience of the world. And I would like to ask, do you think that that's his greatest legacy, that we have told the world about the world from Aberystwyth, that we're having crisis games in Greginog in a couple of weeks, and people are telling the world about what's really going on. It's been Aberystwyth's greatest legacy. I'm always amazed that when I go anywhere um, among people who study the subject, and even people who study related subjects, like law, um, 
sociology, um, other kinds of subjects in the general sort of social sciences, um, that they instantly, oh, Aberystwyth, oh, you, even if they don't know which department I'm from, they'll say, oh, you have an excellent department of international politics there, don't you? Uh, I say, yes, of course we do. Um, it, it's the reputation of the department, which is partly based upon being the first, um, but also based on work that's been done since 1919, I'm glad to say. Um, it's, it's really humbling and it's, it's very amazing. Um, and when we had a round of academic appointments about 18 months ago, uh, we hired eight members of staff in one fell swoop, which was quite a big job. Um, but we hired people from literally all over the world, Australia, the US, China, um, and, and they were eager to come and eager to uproot their families and move across the world um, to live in a small town on the west coast of Wales because it is an exciting, vibrant intellectual community. And, you know, it's, it's a great thrill to be able to work there. And I think, yes, you're right. I think the education, um, the, the, contribu the contribution that it's made to, um, to the lives of students and their outlook on the world, as well as to shaping an academic discipline, um, is, in my opinion, um, a far more important and, and lasting a legacy um, than, than Davis's ideas about an international police force and who should have controlled the poison gas. So, yes. That's okay. The way things are going, Scotland almost voting for its own independence, Wales a bit behind, but Catalonia, um, Brit uh, Brittany, regions of Europe, do you see that as a trend that could continue with um, and Crimea, um, re smaller regions demanding and possibly gaining in the future their own independence? Do you think democracies can't really stop that? If one goes, a lot of them will ask the same things. I think Crimea doesn't belong in your, no, I know, yeah, in your, in your list for, for lots of reasons. Um, although when we had our round table in September, a student came up to me and, and said to me very earnestly, um, but look at the high turnout rate in Crimea. I said, I need to teach Russian politics again. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's been too long since I've taught Russian politics. Um, ooh, that's, a, that's, that's one of these perennial um, questions about how small can a state be, how small should it be, um, you know, what should be the, the criteria for determining an independent sovereign state. Um, you know, these are ones we could probably argue about all night long. Um, I mean, all of these cases are ones which have been brewing, which have been developing for a long time, and they each have their own particular contexts, and they each have their own particular dynamics. So I don't see it as, as, again, this isn't my particular area, nationalism and, and, uh, and sovereignty, but um, I honestly don't see it as some kind of a, of a giant um, you know, domino effect of you know, suddenly everybody will decide that, that they have to have their own state. Um, I think there are very particular historical and, and political and, and social and economic contexts behind those, those votes and that um, it's not something that I necessarily see spreading um, just because it's, it's a fashion or just because we get the idea from other people. Um, hi, sorry. As a recent graduate of Aberystwyth and now working at the Assembly, I just wanted to pick up on something you said earlier about um, getting more women into, into the department, not only as lecturers and academics themselves, but also as students. I just wondered if you could comment on that and how you maybe plan in the next couple of years to be roping in maybe some, some more young women. Yeah, I wish I had um, a, a, an actual um, definitive reason why our gender imbalance is the way it is. I mean, I've got my suspicions that it has something to do with the, the portfolio of degree schemes that we offer and the prominence of strategic studies and military history in those degree schemes. Um, but there might be other things happening as well. And I think <clears throat> we are doing our best on a number of fronts to try and, and get the word out and tr uh, to, to young women as well as young men who might want to be students um, of ours and, and to look at what kinds of things we're offering um, and just to see you know, how, how can we appeal um, to more young women. Uh, but it's definitely something that we need to be doing, um, partly because, you know, if you look at, at across the UK, uh, there's slightly more young women than young men um, going into higher education, and yet in, in our department it's totally the opposite uh, by some very large extent. So we, we need to do something a bit different to try and address that.
Um, I just wanted to ask, um, to what extent do you see history as cyclical? Um, and do you think that um, studying IR really um, makes us find ways of changing um, the world in the future, or does it make us just understand how things have happened so far? And sort of adding on to that, do you think that we may be headed for another Cold War? I'm going to take the second one first because it's easier. Um, I think in some respects we're already there, all right? Um, I mean, we're, not, we're clearly not in an, in an ideological Cold War as we were in the post-1945 Cold War. But I've, for another project that I've been working on, um, I've been reading the collected works of Ken Booth um, for, for a chapter that I'm writing for a book. And um, one of the things I came across when I was reading Ken recently was his notion of the Cold War of the mind which is about our mindset, how we think about um, other countries, certain other countries. And that struck me, I mean, I was reading that just before the NATO summit, and it really struck me as, as having a, a fundamental truth at the heart of it, um, if we think about um, the relationship between the West and Russia, uh, which is my particular interest, um, which is that, um, you know, it seems to me that, that the trust was never really established between the West and Russia after the end of the Cold War. Um, there were other kinds of, of emotions and, and uh, factors going on in that relationship, um, but, but trust wasn't one of them. And we never really uh, overcame the Cold War of the mind in our relationship with, with that country. And so everything that we, when we look at what Russia does and what Putin does, we see it through a particular um, set of lenses. Um, and not a different set of lenses. It's not to condone um, the invasion of Crimea or any of the other things that, that have happened recently, but just to say um, we put certain interpretations on um, what Russia does, and it, it shapes the way that we respond. And I think um, that to a pretty large extent, we're, we're probably already into a Cold War sort of mindset. The question about cyclical history is a really big one, um, which I would be reluctant to make a, a firm uh, position on. Although I would say that uh, you, the more I look at, at particular issues, for example, the issue of women's involvement in war, um, the more I can see cyclical dimensions of it coming through. That, that for example, you know, when a war happens, um, women are, are mobilized and told, you know, yes, this is appropriate behavior for you, and then the war finishes and they're told to go back home again, and then the next war comes and it all, it all starts again. Um, so I think there are cyclical elements to history for certain, and I don't think that we're all um, moving uh, nicely, neatly in, in some sort of progress uh, necessarily. Um, but I think beyond that, I'm not going to commit myself. All right, um, thank you very much for your attention and for your questions. I've enjoyed trying to engage with them, although they've been very big questions and I'm not sure I've adequately responded. Um, but uh, thank you for your attention and for coming out tonight. And um, I hope to maybe have a chat with you afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>